A church bell rings on a hillside, while a man enjoys some alone time fiddling away on a cigar box. The Fox Fire Museum and Heritage Center in Rabin County. It's a fascinating glimpse of earlier generations, a time capsule, so to speak, that captures the sights, sounds, and lifestyle of the North Georgia mountains from the 1820s to the 1940s. We have a mission, you know, and it's to preserve the culture of the Southern Appalachian Mountains, and, and that's what we do at the museum. And we also want to teach people about that history and culture. So we are very specific about what we do. And really, most of our, the research we do occurs in our own collection. We have well over 2,000 interviews, you know, 100,000 images, I don't know, 3,000 hours of audio. So when we want to confirm something, we look within ourselves for the most part because we have the best collection dealing with Southern Appalachian culture anywhere. My grandparents were from North Georgia and every time I walk around this place and smell the, the fire from the blacksmith or, or hear him uh, banging on a piece of metal or hear the church bell ring, it takes me back to a time in my life that was so important to me and I think that that's what resonates with so many people when they come to Fox Fire. It really takes them back to what they may have either heard from their grandparents or may have um, been passed down through the generations to their family. And so, you know, it's kind of like a song. Many times a song will take you back to a certain time in life. And I think for so many people, when they walk on the grounds of Fox Fire and they see the different buildings and read about the different people, it takes them back to a different time in life. To appreciate the Fox Fire experience, it's important to know its origin. In 1966, a local group of high school students at Rabin Gap Nakuchi School needed inspiration and were assigned the task of interviewing family, friends, and neighbors about early Appalachian culture. Years down the road, those interviews became a series of magazines which resulted in the now popular Fox Fire books. In 1974, Royalties from the first book were used to purchase the land which now houses the museum and the surrounding buildings. So we have over 100 acres of mountainside property, goes all the way up to Black Rock Mountain State Park, and the students decided to create a space for their learning, for future students, and for their community as well. So they converted this place, it was an old orchard, into a learning center. And they salvaged historic buildings in their community, dismantled them and rebuilt them here. Um, and now we have over 20 historic structures that were all constructed by both those students and their community members. So Fox Fire preserves how people lived in this area many, many years ago. It gives them a glimpse into what it was like being in the mountains, surviving in the mountains, living day to day in the mountains. You learn about what it meant to live in a one room cabin with a family and survive. And the uniqueness of the culture, um, how they preserved the, the, um, the way of life that um, sustained them. Sustainability, of course, often associated with farming and agriculture. Another attractive feature about Fox Fire that officials have gone to great lengths to preserve. Well, we have a lot of outbuildings, you know, that are associated with any farm. We have two barns that are, are really interesting to look at that are made out of logs. The one right near us here, the Beck Barn, is really a, a large barn for the time period. It's about 1900, and it's roughly 30 by 30 feet, and it's called a cross hall design, which is not very common for this area. And it would store your animals and implements. And typically in this area, your barn was more important than your house and was bigger than your house. Uh, the grist mill is, is awesome. It's, it's the first building that was brought up here. The students didn't know what a grist mill was, so they, they learned about it, uh, talking to Aunt Ari. And so they got permission to, to acquire it and they took it apart, brought it up here. And it was actually made in the 1930s, but it was made in a style that would have been consistent with the 1830s. And you're mostly raising corn. You know, that was a primary crop here. 
And people were using animals for a long, long time. Even in the 1970s, when students were doing interviews, there were still people plowing with mules and, and farming with other animals. Uh, even oxen were still being used. So it's still a kind of a transition period here. And although tractors were available, people were reluctant to, to let go of their mules. They were just fond of that type of power and were loyal to their animals, which is it's pretty neat. We have you know this massive collection of oral history records dating back to the early 60s when the students first started that capture historic farming practices. So a lot of the people they interviewed were still practicing self-sustainability. They were still growing gardens with heirloom seeds. They were still raising livestock and using very old tools from earlier um, centuries. You know, and so all of that got preserved in our archive, but it still continued in practice, both through the people who come here to demonstrate and through the um, ways that we engage with research and public programming. So, you know, there are so many components of both history and agriculture and, and, and culture in general that are just intertwined and all come together in this one place. Mm -hmm.